Welcome back to Vitamins in Biochemistry on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to talk about the last of the B vitamins, and that's vitamin B12. Um, vitamin B12 is most often what you hear it referred to as, um, but the actual correct name of this is cobalamin. All right. The cobe in the name cobalamin comes from the fact that this particular macrocyclic structure shown in blue has a cobalt in the center. All right, so we've seen some uh, macrocyclic structures such as heme that have iron. Uh, we've certainly seen chlorophyll that has a magnesium. Um, uh, but this one, cobalamin or B12, has a cobalt. And it turns out that once again, changing the transition metal is actually going to change the properties of cobalamin. All right, and we actually have a playlist dedicated to cobalamin, which this video will also be put in there. All right, so vitamin B12 is really strange in the sense that in humans, it's not used for very many reactions. In fact, um, I believe there are a few very minor ones, but in general, there are only two notable reactions that actually use vitamin B12. The first one is methionine synthase, which is going to take pre-existing homocysteine and convert it to methionine. The other reason it's used is for uh, methylmalonyl CoA mutase, which is used in beta oxidation of odd numbered carbon fatty acids. Okay, and it turns out that vitamin B12 deficiency causes anemia. We won't go into that too much in this video, but if you are deficient in B12 for a, for a long period of time, it can cause some serious issues even though it's only used in two reactions. Now, because B12 is involved in the steps to make s methionine or SAM, which is, it's in the SAM cycle, SAM is used to methylate DNA and control expression of genes. So if you don't have SAM because you don't have B12, you are royally, I'm not going to use the word, but suffice it to say you're pretty messed up. And in fact, this deficiency can kill you. What's surprising is that it's not necessarily to the same extent, but about one-third of Americans are deficient in B12. Um, it's a very common deficiency, and it's particularly more common in vegetarians and vegans, and it's, it's also common in people that eat a very unhealthy standard American diet with lots of processed foods. Okay, um, And this right here is the structure of B12. B12, in terms of coenzymes, is the largest of all of them. It's massive. And if it's not made in humans, it's not made in mammals at all. Um, it's actually made in bacteria, okay? And so we're going to have to get this ultimately through eating something that eats bacteria. Um, we get this through eating animal products, okay? The vast majority of the B12 that you can get is going to be in animal products such as meat um, of any kind, really. Um, animal products basically have cobalamin. Plant products, generally, are very, very deficient in B12, relatively speaking, when you compare them to meats. Okay, That's why vegetarians and vegans are usually fairly deficient in cobalamin. Um, a not so surprising fact is that vegetarians and vegans are more deficient in B12 than even standard Americans eating the standard American diet. So B12 deficiency is very common and one of the issues with it is that B12 tends to be destroyed, like a lot of vitamins, from heating. That includes cooking and all sorts of stuff like that. Okay, Now, we're not going to get into the, uh, the, the medical side of this, um, but we're going to go into the absorption and the metabolism of B12 and hopefully get an understanding of how it works. But there is one thing I want to point your attention to in this structure. Okay, Number one, we have this blue macrocyclic structure which chelates the cobalt in the center. But one thing I want you to, to pay attention to is this R group up here above the cobalt that's axial or perpendicular to the ring. All right. The R group's identity varies. All right? We can actually have an adenosine group up there, or really it's going to be a 5 prime deoxyadenosine. All right? um, we'll just call it adenosine, okay? but it's a 5 prime deoxyadenosine. This can be a methyl group, a hydroxyl group, or a cyanide group. Okay? Cyanide. It turns out that this R group actually has some other properties too. It can actually be carbon monoxide, it can be nitric oxide. There's a lot of things that can bind here. Okay, and as we're going to find, whatever R group is up here is going to play a role in what happens to B12, what reactions it does, and how you have to process it. All right, 
So this is a, a basic idea of how B12 is handled once you eat it and getting it into cells. And it turns out that B12 actually getting it into cells is drastically more complicated than a lot of other vitamins. There's a, there are some other vitamins such as pantothenic acid, um, biotin, and uh, lipoic acid that all get just simply absorbed by a vitamin transporter. Um, it turns out B12 is a lot more complicated. Let's take a look at it and hopefully understand it. When you eat cobalamin, B12, it's going to be in food. So before it gets to the stomach, stomach it's bound to the food. I mean, that's pretty obvious. Every vitamin is going to be bound to food once you eat it. Whenever you get to the stomach and you've eaten a meal, particularly high protein, um, you get a lot of acid in the stomach. The pH is going to go down to about 1, 1 1.5 as we know. And that acid is going to release the cobalamin from the dietary protein, along with pepsin hydrolysis of the protein. So you'll have, you'll have a B12 in the stomach um, that's free for a while. However, the gastric glands are going to secrete haptocorin, a protein, which is going to quickly pick up the, the B12. The reason you have to have this haptocorin is because B12 eventually will react with acid. Okay, B12 is pretty stable, but it's, it can react, and you don't want it to get destroyed. So the, the body has to do a lot of care to make sure that B12 is, is stabilized, and so it can get absorbed once you get to the ileum of the small intestine. All right, so haptocorin picks up B12 once it's released from the dietary protein. All right, now also one thing the stomachs do, the stomach does, I should say, grammar, right? The gastric uh, parietal cells, they release a protein called intrinsic factor. All right, intrinsic factor does not yet bind onto uh, B12 because B12 is bound to haptocorin. But suffice it to say, the haptocorin B12 complex is going to go into the intestines. And the intrinsic factor is going to go into the intestines, all right? Now, a little bit more physiology here. The pancreas, its exocrine glands secrete proteases and bicarbonate. The bicarbonate is to neutralize the stomach acid and bring it to about a pH of 8 or so. Um, but it's also to uh, stabilize the proteases that it releases and bring them to the optimum pH. The proteases released by the pancreas, so things like trypsin, chymotrypsin, and so on and so forth, are going to clip up the haptocorin. So haptocorin's dead. Luckily, though, the stomach released intrinsic factor, so as soon as the B12 gets released from proteolized haptocorin, the intrinsic factor picks up the B12. It's all about stabilizing the B12. You've got you've to prevent it from being destroyed. All right? Now, intrinsic factor now has a grip on, on cobalamin, B12. All right? As soon as the intrinsic factor cobalamin complex forms, it's going to keep moving through the small intestine until you get to the ileum, all right? And the ileum enterocytes absorb the complex of intrinsic factor in B12. And that's going to lead us to this picture over here. So the ileal enterocytes absorb the intrinsic factor bound to B12. Intrinsic factor binds to a receptor, okay? In fact, this intrinsic factor and B12 complex are actually taken into the enterocyte, ultimately through receptor-mediated endocytosis. All right, you can look at all the physiology that has to do with that, but suffice it to say, once the, the B12 intrinsic factor complex have been endocytosed into the cell, you get the whole thing where they're combined with a lysosome and so on and so forth, and the lysosome breaks down the intrinsic factor. So now you have free cobalamin. Well, the free cobalamin doesn't just stay in the enterocyte, it has to do something else. It has to bind to a protein the protein's called transcobalamin 2, TC2. Now, the main thing I want you to pay attention to this picture is we have an enzyme in the lysosome that also acts on the, uh, acts on the cobalamin once it's released from intrinsic factor. Now, go back up here. Remember, we have this R group up here that can be cyanide or something like that. Or it can be an alkyl group, depending. All right? There's an enzyme called cobalamin 1 decyanidase or dealkylase. The point is, is this is, a, this is a redox active enzyme. What it's designed to do is, number one, get the uh, cobalamin into the 3 plus state, which is right here. It's designed to get into the 3 plus state, but it's also designed to remove that R group. Okay, if there's a cyanide, remove the cyanide. If there's an alkyl group, remove the alkyl group. One reason that you'd like to do that in the lysosome is because cyanide is toxic. 
the lysosome is a destructive organelle. So if you've got a destructive molecule like cyanide, then release it in the lysosome. That's why you have these enzymes in here. And as soon as that cobalamin gets oxidized to the 3 plus state, it gets transported out into the cytosol, where you see this cobalamin 3. All right? Now, once we have this cobalamin 3, we have a cobalamin 3 reductase that's going to reduce cobalamin 3 to cobalamin 2. Now, what do I mean? I just want to clarify. When I say cobalamin 3, I mean the cobalt has a 3 plus charge. When I say cobalamin 2, the cobalt has a 2 plus charge, because remember, it's all about that cobalt ion. Now, we're in the cytosol. This cobalt 2 plus, or cobalamin 2 plus, I should say, has two fates, okay? It can either be transported ultimately into the mitochondria or stay in the cytosol for reactions. What it will do is the cobalamin in the 2 plus state will, will become a coenzyme for methionine synthase. Okay, methionine synthase down here uses cobalamin as a coenzyme. And as long as the cobalt is in the 2 plus state, it turns out that methionine synthase can't do anything. So methionine synthase requires an auxiliary enzyme, methionine synthase reductase, which reduces methionine synthase. Specifically, what it's reducing is the cobalamin and it's reducing the cobalt's 2 plus charge to a 1 plus charge. It turns out that with methionine synthase, that cobalt within cobalamin, the coenzyme, that cobalt has to be in a plus 1 charge to be activated. And if you go look at some of the other B12 videos, it'll show you why it has to be in the 1 plus state. And it turns out that when cobalt is part of cobalamin in the 1 plus state, it becomes what we call a super nucleophile. And that's essential for the mechanism of methionine synthase. That's one fate. The other fate is cobalamin-2 can initially be reduced to the 1 plus state and be transported into the mitochondria. This up here in white is the mitochondria. So reduce it with a cobalamin-2 reductase and transport the 1 plus cobalamin into the mitochondria. So here's the mitochondria. The main thing that's going to happen in the mitochondria is that B12 in the 1 plus state is now going to aid in fatty acid metabolism, specifically a branch of beta oxidation that deals with fatty acids that have odd number of carbons. Okay, so particularly we're talking about 3-carbon metabolism. Okay, eventually beta oxidation of 3-carbon metabolism gets down to methylmalonyl-CoA. It turns out there's an enzyme called methylmalonyl-CoA mutase that converts methylmalonyl-CoA into succinyl-CoA, a TCA cycle intermediate. It has to have B12 to function. The specific form of B12 is called 5'-deoxyadenosyl cobalamin. This is cobalamin. This R group can be 5'-deoxyadenosyl. So it turns out that there's an enzyme called cobalamin adenosyl transferase. Okay, this enzyme right here, cobalamin adenosyl transferase, puts a 5 prime deoxyadenosyl group on cobalamin 1. So this adocobalamin, ADOCBL, that, what that is is 5 prime deoxyadenosyl cobalamin. And that's the active form of the coenzyme for methylmalonyl-CoA mutase. And if you want, we have another video on that that explores that reaction further. Okay. Suffice it to say with cobalamin, its metabolism and absorption are very, very complicated, which probably makes sense because cobalamin is a very complicated looking molecule. Okay? But one of the keys here is that you can't live without B12. It is essential, particularly because when you're looking at methionine synthase, which makes methionine, and that ultimately leads to s methionine production, SAM, SAM is used to methylate your DNA, and it controls epigenetic modifications. Okay? It controls gene expression. If you can't control your gene expression because you can't make SAM, you're screwed. And so you have to have B12 to live. Also, it's been shown that people that have a mutation in methylmalonyl-CoA mutase, which can also be manifested by a B12 deficiency, they also have problems because three carbon fatty acids tend to build up and cause problems. All right. So hopefully that makes sense. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.